Business Roller Coaster. Today we have Alicia Bonner Ness, who is the owner of Hexagon Productions. And I'm so excited for this call because we've had great chats before, and I know that this one's going to be great as well. So, welcome. Hi, Taryn. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. Cool. I'm so excited to have you here. So, yeah. the first question I have for you is to give us an overview of Hexagon Productions and where it came from and what you do. Sure. Um, so I, uh, I spent about 10 years of my life in the social sector working for a range of nonprofit organizations in international development, national security, uh, various other sort of nonprofit organizations. And in the summer of 2016, I, through a bizarre series of events, was offered the chance to join the Hillary Clinton campaign as a field organizer in Florida. And uh, so I, you know, I sort of had this, this choice, like, wow, I can keep doing what I'm doing, working for nonprofits, or I can make this crazy choice to pull the plug on my life and do something totally different where I really have no idea what will be on the other side. Obviously, campaigns end. Uh, so, you know, the first time that I'd ever undertaken a job that had a definitive end date associated with it, um, at least in my sort of the arc of my career. And yeah. so I did that. I moved to Florida. I spent, um, I think it was about 100 days, maybe a little bit more than that, working on the campaign. Um, and at the end, obviously, we all know how that story ends. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I sort of had that zero velocity moment of like, oh, wow, okay, this is what life feels like at a standstill. And what do I do now? So out of that moment, and um, quite frankly, out of a lot of the lessons learned from my experience on the campaign, as well as over the course of my career, came this realization that I believe that purpose is fundamentally important to the future of business, to the future of economy and organizations. Um, profit has been the primary driver of the 20th century, and I think that purpose is the driver of the 21st century. So um, from that realization came the development of the Heptagon method, which is a seven-step method that takes brands from ideology to action. It's focused on helping mission-driven organizations engage for change. So um, a lot of marketing best practices are built around uh, the idea of transaction, right? I give you this money and you give me this product or service. But when it comes to motivating movements, when it comes to mobilizing advocates, there isn't really a transaction at the heart of it. You really need to bring people together in a way that they can find common cause and conviction without necessarily getting anything out of it themselves except the success of the, of the movement that they're a part of. And so that's what the Heptagon Method is about, this idea that when we have ideological clarity, when we all share the same values and we believe the same thing, and we come together in one room, in one space, that's really where the magic happens, where we grasp the potential to engage for change, to see our collective power to change the world. And so the Heptagon Method gave way to Heptagon Productions, which is a brand activation agency that focuses on branding for change-making initiatives, um, event production, and experience design, and then uh, community engagement strategies. So how do you keep your community engaged and active in the long term? Um, so that is, that's what I wake up to every day. That's amazing. I love so much. I do feel like you're on the forefront of this. Like people are starting to talk about it, but they're not talking about it enough, which is also why I was so glad to have you on here. But the, the idea of like purpose driven business is, is starting to show up, which is really, exciting. absolutely. but there absolutely. are still a lot of people that are in this kind of, um, old thinking where they're like, Oh, well, how are we going to make money? What's the like, what's the dollar amount? How much can we squeeze out of people? And, right. and when I hear those things, I always kind of panic a little bit where it makes me feel like if the only reason you're in business is for money, I don't know if your business is going to succeed or if it's going to be around for that long because it, there has to be more than that. So I totally agree with you about that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, the profit maximization mindset that 
the number one goal is growth and the secondary goal is efficiency, you know, drive down costs, drive up profits. Yeah. It just pays no attention to one, the human experience of living inside of an ecosystem that does those things. And two, it, it has no way of accounting for the, the resource cost of that mindset. So when human resources are only the cost of their source, um, we don't appreciate the, the cost of there. I think something that is also going to flow out of this is the cost of the bending the supply chain arc into circular economy models and stuff, which is not my, not my, I'm certainly an advocate and a student on those topics. It's not my particular area of expertise, but definitely something that I think is flowing out of this, that I hope is flowing out of this, this no, move towards purpose. So true. Even just if you talk to a lot of people in this day and age, there's this kind of general feeling of, well, there's a general feeling of multiple things. There's a general feeling of distrust that's happening a lot. And then there's also this like feeling of not um, being connected to the companies that people work for and feeling like they're over exhausted and tired and um, that they're basically just going through the motions at that point. Like I have a lot of friends that I talk to that are like, you know, okay, so I'm going to go into work and then I'm going to do stuff and there's too much on my plate and I can never get to the bottom of my to-do list. So there's these expectations that I'll never be able to meet and then I'm going to go home and then do it all over again. And you're yeah. right. That isn't a human existence. Like that isn't what we should be experiencing as humans. I love the idea of like, you're talking about these causes, which also creates community and bonding. And that is like a big part of human existence that people are missing out on right now. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately when you live for, when you do your job only to get paid, you're doing individual profit seeking, right? It's like, I am doing this job simply because I have to, to survive. And that's not to critique people. I mean, I know lots of artists and things like that who have jobs that, you know, service industry jobs that where they need to make that money in order to underwrite the, their, the work that they're passionate about. But I think that even if you, like, even if you're a barista in a coffee shop, right, like, but just not to say that that's a bad job, but that, like, you should like that. Like, if you're someone who doesn't either like making coffee or like talking to people, that sounds like that's, that's terrible, right? That's jail. Like, why, why would you that society would force you to do that just because you can't, you know, to, to be able to afford your rent is, um, I don't know. I, I think we're confronting big questions and we can get into this or not, but like big questions as a society around what it means to work and what it means to earn and what is the responsibility of business or, or, you know, value creation. Let's not use the word business, right? Value, social value creation to, to, people. Yeah. I love it. Um, okay. So the next question I have for you is, so you kind of talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to ask the question anyway, just to see if it like fleshes it out a little bit more, which is where do you see having a purpose fits into business besides what you've already talked about? Sure. So uh, purpose a little bit, in my opinion, has maybe replaced innovation as an overused, under scrutinized word in society or in business practice for sure. So um, one of the things that I emphasize is a, my definition of purpose as, as I define it when I talk about it. It's composed of two things. So purpose comes from having a far reaching ambitious vision of future possibility really knowing what you're shooting at. What is the destination at the end of the journey? Yeah. At which point you will say the work is done and maybe it will be accomplished in your lifetime. Maybe it won't. Maybe it's a generational issue. But that really having crystal clear understanding of the vision that you're shooting at. And then the second part of purpose for me is values. So how do you show up in doing the work that you're doing. The extreme farcical example that I like to use is, uh, let's say this, there are 5 million homeless people in America and we wanna give them all homes. So one of the ways that we can give all those people homes is we can go out and find 5 million homeowners and we can kill them in their sleep. And then we can give their homes to homeless people or we can build 5 million new homes. Yeah. So obviously, you know, 
committing mass murder on an epic scale is not realistic, but it's emblematic of the values yeah. that are part of pursuing that, that, that vision. And a lot of times we take values as intrinsic or we assume that they're understood, but we need to be explicit about the values in order to help people feel connection in that common cause. So to me, purpose is both the articulation of an ambitious vision and the articulation of clear values and guiding principles that are integrated into how the organization works and how it supports both the employees that are a part of it and the people who it serves in delivering its mission. Yeah, so I think that's a great example to use something that's so, you know, like we know we don't want to murder a bunch of people, but how you go about doing things is really important yeah. into like how you actually achieve your vision. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I call that um, in the Heptagon method, the first step is what we call ideology. And ideological clarity is that piece that really says, this is what we believe. This is what we're seeking. This is why we're doing the work that we're doing. Um, and to, to have that fundamental understanding at the get-go means that everybody's on the same page. Yeah. So um, another question I want to ask you is how do you go about getting people on board with this idea? Because a lot of people in business these days, they, uh, they want to move really quickly, right? So there's this like speed that happens and they're also really visual. And so you're talking about a lot of these things that are so, so important, but sometimes people don't recognize the importance of them and how much it can help them later. So I'm curious, like how you get people to, you know, get on board with this and really spend the time here that needs to be spent in order to create what you're trying to create with Hepsagon Production. Yeah, I, I guess the short answer to that question is I haven't fully cracked the nut yet. I, I think, so our, our first audience or our first um, target customer for this idea is the social sector. So um, working less from a standpoint of how do you convert business from profit to, um, to purpose, which is definitely necessary, and more from the perspective of how do you help mission-driven organizations that are already in operation be much more strategic and effective in how they engage for change. Um, so I think that audience, they're already trying to mobilize people and, and engage advocates. They're just doing it. A lot of nonprofit communications and marketing happens in a very ad hoc way yeah. and tries sometimes to borrow directly from private sector marketing methodology, which can work sometimes, or is so wholly myopic in its focus on fundraising as, you know, it, it, like in a 1990s style that they don't see the opportunities to do more things. Um, and so th that's been the primary target that I've been, that I've been working towards reaching in my first year and a half or so. Um, but I do definitely see a lot of potential here in business for sure, but also in politics. You know, my experience on the campaign, one of the things that really came through and one of the reasons that I think ultimately we were not successful is that the Hillary Clinton campaign did not have ideological clarity. We had a lot of policy promises that we wanted to make and a lot of, a lot of issues, talk about a lot of issues that we thought were important to people. Yeah. Um, but we really didn't have ideological clarity in that sense of being able to say, this is the vision that we see and you know, these are the values that we stand by. And I think that really hurt us in our ability to help people find common cause in the campaign. Um, it was much more a campaign against a negative force than it was a campaign for a positive, aspirational future vision. Um, and so I think there's a huge opportunity in the political domain as well to use this, this notion of ideological clarity to help movements start and um, multiply. Yeah, that's, that's a good point to like start where people are actually willing to kind of make yeah. that shift versus like going into the private sector and like being like, okay guys, let me, let me help you. Um, and I think that sometimes I try to do that and it's, it's not my job to change the entire way that people think. And that's been something that um, has been like a learning piece of my business of like knowing where people are willing to shift and change and, and getting them outside of their comfort zone is good, but you also have to keep in mind like where they're coming from as well. So 
Absolutely. Yeah. Change is hard. And, and a lot of, we have a very strong emphasis in our business culture on evidence mm -hmm. as a motivation for making changes and making decisions. Um, that's another thing that we could probably hold up to the light a little bit more just because evidence is its own little kettle of fish, but uh, not that evidence, evidence is great, but you know, how evidence is constructed is its own sort of has its own yeah. logic puzzles built into it. Um, but so being able to demonstrate impact in any sector is a way to build evidence that then has the potential to, to motivate others. Yeah. And obviously yeah. with you guys also looking at user experience design, like, you know, how important it is to, or at least what I think is really um, persuasive is when you are recording people's facial expressions, because that, that gets in the people's, um, it actually gets them to react in a different way because they're not seeing their users as numbers. And so mm. them to the people that they're serving, then they're much more likely to invest more time or money or whatever it is in a product because they realize, oh, there's somebody at the end of this and that person looks like somebody I know. And so there's this, um, yeah, it, I, I could go into the whole evidence thing too, where like, I know that I've used evidence to try to help persuade people to what I want as well. <laughs> um, so right. It happens, you know, regardless of the uh, different industry that you're in, you are trying to like persuade people it's because you, you do care and you do want to help. Right. right. And what evidence it, I mean, as you're saying, right, we can take as evidence a statistical report or we can take qualitative evidence of testimonials or interviews or what have you. Something else that I think is really powerful is the human experience of bringing people together. So thinking about the workshop environment as a way for people to both understand each other, understand their customer, um, and then together build ideas, build that vision, those values out of that shared experience. That to me is really the ideal future. It's not to say that we, you, you know, cloister leaders in a back room and say, you guys decide, but to say, hey, let's open the door and bring the customer in and let them talk to us about what's important to them. Yeah, for sure. Workshops are like my favorite thing, like just design thinking, because yeah. you are getting to bring in all these different people into the same room and you're creating, yeah, you're creating this like unity that people didn't even realize that they needed. And absolutely. I just get so excited about that because when you give somebody some, somebody something that they didn't even know that they needed and then it affects them so positively for the rest of the project, like, I don't know, it just feels so good to have that level of impact on something. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. All for workshops. So another question I have for you about Hexagon Productions, because this is the business roller coaster. And so I want to know about like when you've gone into the down times of your business, what has been the biggest struggle with running Hexagon Productions so far? <sighs> um, the biggest struggle I would say has been um, two things that both undermine each other. So um, about uh, towards the middle of last year, I um, st started writing a book about the Heptagon method. Um, and it was sort of slow going at first and then uh, got going a little bit more and then stopped. I got a big project that I worked on last fall that basically took all of my free time. And then Earlier this year, like March, April, and May, I sort of gave myself a break from other things and was like, okay, I'm just going to focus on writing the book. Um, and I did well. You know, I probably completed like four or five chapters in the course of those three months. Um, but I, in giving myself a break from trying to sell business, I then wound up in a place where I was like, oh shoot, the year's halfway over and I haven't done as much work this year as I, as I wanted to do. So I think both completing on the book and so the, to complete the story on the book, once, once I drafted all those chapters and I compiled them together into a manuscript and started going through the process of reading it and was like, oh my God, this is terrible. This thing that I wrote nine months ago that I thought was good when I wrote... Um, so then getting discouraged in the process of like, oh, okay, now I actually have to go back and rewrite everything that I've already written. You know, it's like I've manufactured the clay. Now I actually have to go sculpt it into something that people actually want to look at. 
Yeah. Um, and at the same time, then how do you balance like working on a project, like writing a book and selling business in order to keep your business going? So I think that those have been um, my biggest challenges. I've also been working on building the brand collateral for Heptagon this year. So also selling business while you're building collateral is a little bit of a tricky thing. Um, you know, I, I like to call it like building the airplane while you're flying it. It's <laughs> exhilarating, but also terrifying. <laughs> I feel you on that. Like the, there's also this, like what happens to me is I'll start a project with a client or multiple clients, and then I'll forget about the other side of my business, which is talking to people and like thinking about potential clients and you know, totally. making, doing marketing or whatever else, because I'm over here. So it's the same thing. It's just like juggling and and when you, when you feel like you have all this work, and sometimes you might even have too much work, then you definitely are not thinking about, you know, getting more work. You're like, no, please stop. But then as soon as you do that, then all of a sudden you finished your projects and then you're like, wait a second, I, I didn't time that right. Or at least that's what I felt in my business <laughs> is the timing has been something that is slowly getting tuned in um, over time, but still needs a lot of work for me. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I'm also still trying to find the, find the balance point on that. Yeah. That's a good one to think about. Um, yeah. And writing a book, that's amazing. Like what, how are you feeling about the book now? What kind of gave you the motivation to write it and where, 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 where do you want to um, take it? I, so the book is about, um, it's about the heptagon method. So it details in depth each of the seven steps and it uses both research and anecdotal examples from my life and career just to, to explain what each of the steps, what, what each of the steps are and, and how to, you know, how to use it. So it's designed to be a little bit, you know, maybe 50% men, memoir, 40% um, user manual, if you will, and then, you know, 10% curiosity, inspiration for people who are, um, especially curious about the campaign. So I, I, uh, one of the big examples that I use is my time on the campaign and how that informed different aspects of the, the, the way that the model, the heptagon method is shaped. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm feeling good about it in a sense because I do have 50,000 words. So that's cool. Um, I want to take a moment to like applaud that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's, it's, uh, but it's really like, it's like, it's like once you've hiked up the mountain and you're standing on the summit and you're like, yes, this is the mountain summit. And then you're like, shit, I have to walk down the mountain. Um, that's, that's really what 50,000 words feels like. Cause you're not done. You have an enormous sense of achievement, but you are not finished. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm right now in the process of rewriting and editing. Um, I, I previously was the editor of a social impact magazine, so I do have a lot of editing experience. Um, the downside of that is that I'm a very, I'm an excruciatingly demanding editor. So being a demanding editor of myself is sort of like cutting yourself with tiny knives. I have a lot of empathy for all of the people who I edited over the years who felt like I was like beating them alive with a pen. Um, so that's been fun. And really what's hard about it is um, getting like I, a few weeks ago, I spent 10 hours working on two chapters of the book over a weekend just because I went down a rabbit hole and I was like, okay, I'm in this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this chapter done. And I came out and I was like, oh my God, that was 10 hours of my life. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to like, it's, it's hard to schedule, you know, it's hard to be like, okay, I'm going to put two hours on my calendar today to work on chapter four. Is that the right amount of time? I don't know. So then it also makes it hard to get in because you know, you're never sure when you're going to get out. Yeah. Um, these are, these are excuses that I'm articulating right oh, now no, for I why, I haven't, why I haven't done. No, I'm just, you know, <laughs> being, being honest with myself and, and our listeners. No, um, but yeah, it's hard. It's hard, but it's also, it's great. And writing down, I'm a big advocate for writing things down, period, like an analog. I'm a huge, I'm like a serial notebook person. So I have different notebooks for every project that I work on because I believe in analog. Um, 
and I write morning pages every morning in another journal. So um, just writing down the stories of my own life of saying, what did I learn? What was that experience has been very, very gratifying. Um, and even going back to things that I did like in college and in my early career where I remember it, but I haven't actually told the story in so long that finding, refinding the details of it has been um, really cool to be like, wow, yeah, I've done some stuff in my life. You know, you wake up every day to your current reality and you forget like 10 years ago, I did a cool thing. I forgot that that happened. Yeah. That's so a, it's been really great. A good way yeah. of like being able to like, I don't know, just give yourself the credit that's due that sometimes I don't think we give ourselves. A lot of times we're a lot harder on ourselves than, than anybody else would ever be for us. Right. So it's nice to also be our own cheerleader in that way and be able to say like, I did all of these things and my life means something. You know? I hope so. Yeah. Maybe not yet, but it's on, it looks like it's pointed in that direction. I'm not sure where the path goes exactly, but like it looks optimistic that way. I don't doubt that you will be doing amazing things just because of all of the conversations that we've had. So what has been the biggest surprise for you with starting a company and going through the process of having, you know, clients and writing this book, just the entire package of Pepsicon Productions? What's the biggest surprise? The biggest thing that has... So... So I spent a lot of time in other organizations that I worked in um, wishing for more visibility. A few years ago, several years ago now, I guess, a mentor of mine, she said something really important to me. She said, Alicia, you have ego and you need to know that. And when she first said that to me, I was, a, I was like taken aback, offended right here. I'm like, you know, a middle manager woman like, oh, I have ego. What, what does that even mean? Um, but she was like, no, you like getting credit for the work that you do. So being in a job where you are invisible will never make you happy. And you need to just embrace that and internalize that and know that when you seek roles, you are going to want that external validation. It's really important to you. Um, which isn't to say that I don't, I love sharing credit with other people too. You know, I love working with incredible teams, but, but it was true. Like she totally nailed it. She nailed me. And and so in becoming the CEO of company, right, there's a lot of, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, when you run your own company, you call yourself whatever you want, right? Um, but the, you are it, right? You are the top. So there's no other deciders. There's no other spokespeople. Um, you are the face. And you get to decide how you spend your time and what you say and, and who you talk to. And I think that the thing that for me has been so striking in becoming a female entrepreneur, air quotes, um, for those listening, is how much airtime is taken up by men. Yeah. Um, and how challenging, now there are incredible, there, this is not to undermine the work of so many incredible women who are out there who are telling their stories and being heard and doing the hard work, right? I, absolutely have enormous respect for those people. But when you look at all of the channels of influence and all of the channels of storytelling, especially like who we see on TV, who we see on the news, who are the people writing columns, even New Yorker magazine, which is a publication that I've read for 10 years, you know, they, they do a great job hiring they have women reporters and they have reporters who are people of color, but sometimes I get an issue and I'm like, man, the three hard hitting articles in this issue are all written by dudes. Like yeah. what is going on? So when I say that out loud, I feel like I'm griping like, why doesn't anybody pick me? I want to talk. But <laughs> you're like, I'm raising my hand. Why are you calling on me? Um, but so, you know, it's like work harder, um, someone screams from the back row, but, um, that has been, I, I guess there's like subtle misogyny in that, that yeah. we then like expect men to be the people of voice and it all starts. So, so I think, um, figuring out how to handle that gracefully has been something that's been. Uh, surprising, but also where my answer to that is that is looking for communities of, of female entrepreneurs. So saying, how can I find common cause with people who I can be fairly certain 
are encountering the exact same thing and are looking to do something about it by supporting each other. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring that up because now I'm, I'm questioning something that I've been thinking about recently, which is, um, I feel like when I started my company, people didn't take it seriously. Like they had this, and maybe this is my perception, like maybe this isn't what people actually thought, but this is the feeling that I got when I talked to people or looked at their facial expressions. And it was kind of like this, oh, okay, so you're, you quit your job without another job and you don't want to have this gap of unemployment. So you've started this business so that you can eventually- Your business is so cute, right? Exactly. Yeah, totally. How's your yeah. business doing that? Or it was also met with like a lot of fear for people like, wait, so like you don't have investment money or like what's the plan or did you save up enough? And so it was one of these two camps of like, you don't really have a business or- why do you have a business that's so scary for you, like freaking out? And I'm just, I'm curious and I'm wondering, like if I had been a man in that same scenario, would I have been met with this, with similar stuff? And I, I don't think that I would have been, right? Like, I think that people would have been like, oh, you're starting a business. Okay. Yeah. And, and that- that's, that's what men do, isn't it? Yeah, so that totally like that threw me off to to have that happen. And then something for me happened around the six month mark where I don't know if it was me and I don't know if it was other people or it was if it was a combination of the two, but something around the six month mark happened where people were like, Oh, you have a business. Like <laughs> I, I'm not sure what happened, but all of a sudden people actually thought that I had a business instead of a business, air quotes for those listening. <laughs> right. Huh. Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, there is a little bit of persisting through it and what we call freelancing versus what we call starting a company is obviously, you know, its own, the definitions of things within the gig economy are themselves up for debate. Yeah. But um, yeah, I definitely have, I've definitely felt that, um, felt that struggle and um you know, I think bootstrapping is also, we don't really have a strong startup culture around that to how do you do incubation and acceleration for people who aren't looking for VC investment. Um, something that I've been really, I haven't been, but that I've learned about that I'm really interested in is um, DazzleCon, the zebra movement. I'm not sure if you've run across this before. Um, yeah, for sure. So basically the idea that we don't need more unicorns, we need more zebras in terms of businesses. Um, you know, and there's a whole story, there's a whole great blog post on Medium about why zebras, right? First of all, zebras are animals that actually exist, not mythical creatures. Yeah. Um, number two, they run in herds, which are called dazzles, which is awesome, which is why the conference is called DazzleCon. So that's been the first that I've seen of, sort of community organizing, if you will, among entrepreneurs and business owners who are interested in like slow, sustainable, incremental growth that is good for people, good for the environment and good for the bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping, I, another community that I'm hoping to get a chance to, to join at some point because, um, yeah, I think we, you know, it's part of it is sticking with it, but also part of it is like, yeah, we have entrenched unconscious bias that is hard for us to shed. So until we, unless we make it conscious and we think about it, um, it it's going to continue to rear its like ugly head from time to time. <laughs> I love that. I also, it's, it's just always so nice to talk to other people in the same situation as me, because I get to hear about all these things that like, you know, like, I don't know how you came across it or if somebody else told you or you found it because you were researching, but I just love that you're sharing this, like this perfect community is what it sounds like. I know that perfect is obviously like, I'm sounding more like a unicorn than a zebra, but <laughs> <laughs> this idea that you, you've just described, I love that there's a group of people that are getting together to do that because um, sometimes I think that entrepreneurship feels really, really lonely. And oh, so God. it's yeah. nice to like have the community and the support and everything else that you, you can find and go along with that. And I want everybody that's listening 
And if they're thinking about starting a business to know that like there are places to go to get that support. If you don't feel like you're getting it from your family or your friends. I mean, some of my like friends and family have been so supportive, but I know that sometimes people have their own emotions about things. So there is ways to start companies and still have support regardless of your social network. Yeah. One community. So just clarifying that DazzleCon is not something that I'm currently actively involved in. It's just something that I've read about and been really interested in. Um, the a community that I would mention that I am actively involved in is Starting Block, which is a community of socially conscious social entrepreneurs and individuals um, where that organization is really focused on um, helping people do the personal work around understanding what your purpose is and finding common cause and allies and doing the work that you want to do to create change in the world. Um, and that's been an incredible, I think there are about 3,000 starting black fellows worldwide. Um, and they do institutes across the United States throughout the year. So that has been an incredible, I did the summer institute in New York uh, I, almost a year ago. And that um, starting black community has been so such a powerful driver for me of feeling like there are people who have my back who I can call on um, and call in when I need when I need support. That's good. Yeah, I think that for me, the whole starting a business, people said like it was going to be hard, but they didn't really give me details about the fact that it was going to be hard. And so I think when people said it was going to be hard, I was under the impression, and maybe people did say this, I'm not sure. I was under the impression that most people think that you need to work, you know, crazy hours to start a business and all of these other things. And that's the, the difficultness of starting a business. And I personally was like very much against like working myself to death to start, to start a business because if I ended up doing that, then I would create this monster that, I would have to keep feeding, you know? So I was like, I only want to work the hours that I want to work. And if it doesn't work that way, then like, it's not for me. The thing yeah. that I found is like not overworking yourself with hours. That's not the hard part. You don't have to overwork yourself with hours. It's the constant reassuring yourself that things are okay. That is like the the part that I think takes a lot of practice and is more difficult that I didn't expect, as well as just like taking care of your body. There's something around the lines of like, if I haven't exercised and if I'm not eating healthy, then like stuff just starts going down in business. And it's, it's just such a, I really like it in a lot of regards because when I used to work for a company and I wasn't taking care of myself, there wasn't that much ramifications that happened, but now there is. So it's actually making me healthier as an individual. I think that goes back to my notion of purpose, right? The values of how we show up in our business. So that extends to how you, how you care for your constituents or your customer should also be the same as how you care for yourself and your people to the extent that you're able. Um, I definitely feel like there is such a hardened narrative around what entrepreneurship, air quotes, forgive me, listener, is um, in, our, in our current, you know, in the current paradigm that it's like 60 hour weeks and no sleep and all the coffee and um, junk food, pizza in the garage, right? Like the Facebook that, not Facebook, sorry, the Google, the Google mythology has extended to how everybody else should work as an entrepreneur. Um, I definitely, you know, a, um, a practitioner who I see in Alexander Technique, um, she said, I think it was her, maybe it was an acupuncturist, I can't remember. Um, but she, someone said to me once, um, men need to do good to feel good and women need to feel good to do good. Now, obviously, sweeping gender stereotypes are not especially helpful because there are always exceptions. Um, and of course, you know, non-binary identities, et cetera. But I think that I do, I do feel that myself, that when I don't feel good, when I am tired, drinking coffee to push myself more doesn't lead to better outcomes. It's better for me to lie down and take a nap than it is for me to try to you know, hammer myself through. Um, and, and I think being, you know, knowing that you're working with people who have the same core set of beliefs is really fundamental in that regard, because 
there are people who will be disappointed. You know, there at, at one point in my past life, I worked with a woman who, who got sick often. She would be, you know, once or twice a month, um, not sure if it was, you know, cycle related or something else. Yeah. She would call out sick from work. And our boss, we reported to the same person, was basically like, why is she never here? Um, and like, not why is she never here, but like, why is she always sick? Like, what? Yeah. shouldn't be sick. You should be working. Um, and, I, and I remember saying to her, I mean, this woman and I were very close. And I was like, look, I don't know. But I, I don't think she's faking it, if that's what you're asking. Like, I don't think she's pretending to be sick in order to stay home. Like, I think she is legitimately unwell. And she's caring for herself. Um, but I, I remember that protest, that pushback of like, you know, that, that industrious mindset of like, if you're not dying, you should be working. Um, and my personal belief is like, let's not get all the way to dying before we decide that not working is the best thing, right? It's like, if you're tired, you should sleep. If you are sick, you should rest. Like, this is not, you know, it's, if you're in physical pain, don't make yourself have more physical pain simply to be present in the office. Like what, who, are you, uh, is that actually, who is that better for? Like who is benefiting in that, in that equation? Nobody. No. Yeah. Right? You're not even present yourself. You're sitting there in pain and not like able to think clearly anyway. Right. So, um, off of that entire, uh, thing, how do you deal with self-care in your business? Hmm. Uh, with a four hour sleep deficit coming off on, into my second day of jet lag. How do I deal? Well, I took a power nap today. So that's something that I do fairly often. Um, uh, you know, just like if I'm not, if I'm feeling tired or like I'm succumbing to social media distraction, I will go lie down for 25 minutes and just yeah. close my eyes, relax my body, relax my facial muscles, look at my eyelids. Um, and just, even if I don't fall asleep, sometimes I fall asleep, sometimes I don't, but just like powering down sensory input is so, so important. Um, I've also tried to become a lot more intentional recently, although again, I, I just got back from vacation where I ate tons of meat products and bread for 10 days. So I currently feel terrible in my body, but in terms of food, um, but really trying to be more thoughtful about like taking supplements and drinking water. It went first thing when I wake up in the morning and, um, you know, shortening my eating window during the day, like all these things that are recommended by various, you know, Ayurveda or other health practitioners that, when you are not conscientious about how you're living your life can easily just fall by the wayside. But when you are intentional about it, you can find that you feel a lot better showing up for your, for your work um, because you are taking these steps to have more energy um, and to, and to just feel well. You know, I, I think that uh, it does take, it takes intention to, to, feed yourself in the, in the right ways. Um, something else that I do, I mentioned earlier, my notebook fetish, um, and my, uh, I, my, my morning pages writing, that's been a habit that I've had for almost three years now, where first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I write between two and three pages in a large notebook, just clear in the radar of everything. So everything that I did yesterday, things that I've been thinking about, things that I'm worried about, you know, listing my to-do list for that day if it's really weighing on me. Um, having that outlet of just pulling things out of my brain and putting them somewhere else leaves me with so much mental clarity and space. Um, and it's also great to, I, I call it like writing, I'm writing my own history, you know? So if I want to go back and be like, Hey, what was it like when I was in the middle of the campaign and felt like I was dying? Even then I wrote one page a day and I can go back and be like, Oh, this is the day that I did that thing. Huh? Okay. Um, and it's really, it feels very like, it feels like I'm taking myself seriously in a, in a good way in, in, in documenting my own life in that sense. So it's both liberating, but also grounding. That's nice. I haven't, so I've heard about morning pages quite a few times and I think that I've never really, I've, I really haven't made the commitment to try it. I keep being like, Oh, I should do that. But there's, 
there's a piece of my personality that really thrives on this idea of like, oh, when I have energy to do things, I'm going to do them. And then mm -hmm. everything works out. And that does work for a lot of things. But I think that something that like I've noticed that I need to work on is creating discipline around like morning routines and evening routines and yeah. not giving myself so much flexibility because it actually ends up impacting, impacting me positively in the end, especially because I travel a lot. So if like everything's so fluid all the time and there's no structure anywhere, and then I start maybe having anxiety about that, I only have myself to blame. So you've inspired me to maybe try to actually commit to doing the morning pages because I like the idea of having your own personal diary and being able to go back and, and be empathetic to your past self to go, oh my gosh, I have gone, so I've come so far from where I was, which I think it's really cool. Yeah, just to give credit where credit is due, Morning Pages come from The Artist Way, which is a book by Julia Cameron um, focused on rehabbing your creativity, um, So, which I have done. I've done all of the first book, most of the second book, um, which is more like a self-guided course, yeah. uh, which I highly recommend. Um, and I have felt in my pages, so it's both like radar clearing, but you'll also surprise yourself with ideas that will just find you in the morning in that, in that moment of clarity. Yeah. Um, so I totally hear you about like doing things when you have the energy to do them. One of the things that I notate in my morning pages is the time that I'm writing them. So that's also a good record of like, did I write them at 10 15 or did I write them at six thirty? Yeah. Um, of like measuring wh how was I doing and optimizing my life and my day in this week or this month or this day. Um, so yeah, just treating it how I've dealt with it is not like it's a thing for me to necessarily exert myself on. Yeah. It's just something that I insert, you know, it's 30 minutes of time that I insert into the beginning of my day whenever my day starts. So sometimes I oversleep and I don't get started early. Sometimes I get started really early. Like yesterday, I woke up at 4.30 a.m. So, you know, and it's just like, that's the first step. That's the place where I go to clear myself out, set myself up, um, and that that leaves me feeling very focused and grounded no matter where I am. Yeah, but do you... Um do you have the notebook by your bed where like you, that's the first thing you do or do you like get up and like make yourself a cup of tea or coffee or I know this is like a really detailed question. No, that's fine. Um, I, I don't write pages in my bed at home. Yeah. I like to only sleep in my bed. So yeah. I try not to that's a good do idea. other things. Sometimes I read in my bed before bed, but really I try not to do anything in my bed other than yeah. sleep. Um, <laughs> uh, so I get up and I sit on the sofa in the morning. Um, I do usually go, this is very detailed, but I, when I go to bed, I put a water bottle on my bedside table that's full. Yeah. Um, if I drink that by waking up at some point in the night, then I will refill it before I sit down to do my pages. If not, then I just take my water bottle from my bedside table and walk with that to sit on the sofa and, and write my pages. Yeah. Again, part of that hydration, one of the things that I understand is that you're supposed to try to drink like 12 ounces or 16 ounces of water first thing when you wake up in the morning. So those two things sort of go together. Sometimes it's tea, you know, sometimes I'll have green tea in the morning if that's what I'm, if that's what I'm feeling, but some sort of hydration while I'm writing my pages. A lot of sense. I think that something that I added to my morning routine was the very first thing I do, no matter what happens is drink a full glass of water. Mm. And it changed my energy like for the whole day because it basically changed my energy for the morning, which then changed the rest of my day because my mornings were more productive. So I definitely like that's one that I'm not the best about hydrating myself. I actually like as we've been talking, I'm like, why didn't I put my a glass of water out here for myself? And I've been watching you like, like you've oh. watching me drinking. <laughs> Oh my gosh, she's like taking care of herself. So um, yeah, it's something that like I'm not particularly good at, but I think that like I need to get better at over time. Yeah. Anywho, so I think we're we're at the end of this. Is there anything else that you want to talk about before we kind of wrap this up? Well, one of the things that we had chatted about in um, in one of our earlier chats that I felt pretty inspired by that I. I thought maybe I could share um, is this idea around spirituality and belief. Oh, so, yeah, so you know, why, 
process that up. Yeah. Why, why we do what we do. And so obviously, you know, we've talked about purpose and what that means, vision and values. Um, values or, or the idea of a moral compass, which is a term that I use a lot. Um, some people actually object to because they find it too suggestive of religion like the idea the suggestion of morality points towards religion and that a lot of our social organizations especially in um you know elite communities of like high education and privilege have become very secular right there's a lot of disdain for the idea of faith um and i think largely that's because you know evangelical christians i'm just gonna i'm gonna point the finger and say like there's been a lot of not so nice nastiness that's come out of that community of people over the past 25 years um that has given christians a bad name um and has also really like i think denigrated faith as a as a practice and i think that you know when i think in doing the work that I do in, in helping organizations, starting movements, um, obviously that work is not itself. I am an Episcopalian myself, um, but the work that I do is not faith-based, but I think a lot about um, actually our founding fathers and the way that religion informed their mentality, right? They were very adamant about this idea of the separation of church and state and the creation of government. But when you look at the writings of all of our founding fathers, all of them had very strong higher systems of higher beliefs that they uh, subscribed to. And so I think that's also important as we, not prescriptively, right? But it's, it's totally fine to not believe in God um, or any notion of a higher power. Um, but I think that I, and this is actually something that is, that the artist way does deal with, right? This idea of connecting yourself to something bigger than you. Yeah. Um, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about this in her book, Big Magic, that, um, that there's a lot of momentum there in feeling that you're not just doing something for the sake of profit or you're not just doing something for short-term gain. Um, Obviously, there's the, there's the directed purpose of an initiative, but also your individual that I, I feel very much that, you know, I am living in this life, doing the work that I am doing in a way that seeks to meaningfully contribute to society. Yeah. Um, because I believe that we are in service of something higher, whether that something higher is, you know, the evolution of our, our status on the planet as humans, um, or, you know, really, uh, you know, God, capital G, um, <laughs> That, 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 that that's really important. And that I think, um, like I said, not being prescriptive about that or dogmatic, to use a better word in the religious context, to say like, you have to believe this, otherwise you're out. But to really create that space for higher purpose and, and spirituality within how we operate and engage with each other. Um, and that, that that moral... The moral compass within organizations is important, but our moral compass within ourselves is also important. And you mentioned earlier that being an entrepreneur can be very lonely work. And I, I just wanted to echo that. I, I absolutely feel like some days I'm like, what human being am I going to interact with right now? Because um, sometimes there isn't anybody. But that, there, that you, when you feel that connection to something bigger, it feels a little less lonely or it feels like maybe the moments of loneliness, again, not to be too Christian about this, but um, our sort of like time in the wilderness, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's the time where you're doing the work, you're slugging away. Um, you are building the thing that is going to be the vessel that's going to carry your vision into the future. Yeah. And that, that, that there's, there's comfort there. There's comfort there. Comfort there. I don't like something that I've realized, and it's funny too, because um, so I, I, my family was from South Africa, and we grew up in South Africa. So you always went to private school in South Africa if you could afford it, because the school system was not as um, well off. And so then coming to America, my dad was very much like, "You need to go to a private school," and most private schools in America are religious. So I was sent to different sorts of just, yeah, Christian schools, right? 
And I went to Catholic school for four years, which made me very non-religious, actually. <laughs> I was like, no, this is too many rules. I can't deal with it. Um, and so it's interesting for me in my own like spiritual journey is it's been a more like recent development, probably over the past five years where I've realized that like spirit, you can still be spiritual without being religious. And I've gotten a lot more spiritual in the past like two years. And now I understand religious people so much more because spirituality and religion are so closely related. And so previously when I was like, you know, in middle school, going to Catholic school, I just could not comprehend these people that were around me that were religious. But then like getting in touch with my own inner spirituality and, and feeling connected to something bigger than myself and I probably don't follow any particular organization, but if I had to like choose one, it would probably be Buddhist. Um, and that all of a sudden made me realize like, we're all talking about the same thing. Like it's yeah. literally all the same thing. We're all just connected to the same thing. And for me, having that spiritual relationship with consciousness, God, whatever you want to call it, and feeling connected to something bigger than yourself, I don't think my business would be one. It probably wouldn't have been going on as long as it has, just because I would have not felt any sort of support and I would have felt too alone. And two, I just, yeah, I just feel like it would have been so much more difficult and it would have been this like me as a human trying to struggle through things again and again, instead of just saying like, it's not all for me to figure out. Like it's okay for me to feel safe and to go with the flow and to know that I'm taken care of. And I know that obviously like we're getting into faith, which is obviously tied to spirituality, but this idea of having faith in something that's gonna keep you safe can take you so far. And I think that business owners that have that are a lot more likely to um, just, be, just be in a better mental state, but also be able to have the longevity and the sustainability in their business because it's not all this pressure on them to have to solve everything. So right. you, like, it's, I can't, I don't really talk about spirituality a lot with like even people I know, but as it's become more of this thing that's like really made a huge impression on my life as a business owner, I can't really pull the two apart. They have to come together. And if they don't come together, then I don't even know if I would have a business in the end. You know, it's that closely related for me. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I definitely feel, um, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those things where if you defer, like, I think it's so important for each of us to cultivate our own sense of this. Like, yes, yeah, some organized religion is fine. And some people may find wonderful communities of support and faith yeah. in that sense. Um, but I, I, but just like cultivating that channel, right. That we, we, the something that, I think about a lot is the, the, the effect of a profit seeking economic construct, which is that, which is one of scarcity, right? We've, we've created an economic model based on scarcity and the corollary to scarcity is fear, right? If you're, if things are scarce, then it's probable that you won't have enough, which means that you should be afraid that you will not have enough. And so to me, there's this bridge from scarcity to abundance and abundance to faith that is where like fear and scarcity live together, abundance and faith live together. And that if you, and it's hard, right? We are all socially programmed to be afraid of not having enough at every step of the way in our, in our human existence, right? And so to, to claim abundance I think faith is a back support for that, right? It's like if, if abundance is the, is the seat that you're sitting on, faith is a back support to that. It's a way of, of in yourself investing in this idea that there is something behind you. There is wind at your back that is making sure that you will not fall. Um, and you may fall, right? Like failure happens. Injury happens. Terrible things happen to all of us. They are teachers, right? From a karmic standpoint, not to go down another rabbit hole, right? They're, they're teaching moments. They're things where it's like, 
you, your proverbial broken leg is a lesson for you in how to walk. And that you can take those setbacks as personal failures, or you can take them as karmic lessons, right? Where you say like, okay, here's the thing. Here's an obstacle in my path. Uh, what am I going to do with it? And, and to not see that as your own failing, but to see that as, a, as an opportunity to learn. That I think when you see yourself in the, in the context of things in that way, um, you can unload some of your personal responsibility for your own progress. Which isn't to say that you can, you know, go watch Netflix all day and still run a business. You can't. I've tried. But <laughs> um, you can, uh, you know, you, you can, you, you can let, let yourself off the hook a little bit in terms of how much responsibility you have for everything going exactly the right way. Yeah, and a lot of it, too, I think helps you not have this tendency to try to control things that you can't control, right? Yes. If you have this, if you just understand, okay, I can, I have control over these things and I don't have control over these things. If I spend time worrying about things that I don't have control over, what a waste of time. Like, yeah. I just need to move on from those things and, and realize like what's happening right now in this moment and I'm okay now. That's another thing I keep coming back to is right now in this moment, it's okay. There's like nothing bad is happening. I'm safe. And every single time, even when stuff is going wrong, I'm still okay. And it's still going well. So it's, it's kind of like changing your perception and kind of what you were saying too. How do you deal with obstacles? Do you think that this is an obstacle? It's a sign that I shouldn't go that way. Or do you go, Oh, it's, it's just part of the human experience and that's okay. And I'm just learning the lesson and I'm going to move through it. Right. Serenity. I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous has this absolutely right, right? Change the things you can and accept the things you can't and hand the rest over to somebody else because, you know, it's like that's things are going to happen in the world that are outside of your control. Some of them will be great. Some of them will be terrible. Wow. None of them probably mean that you are the wrong thing. You are the right thing. Um, and wherever you are is the right thing in the right place at the right time. And that's been my fundamental, like trying to, it's hard, right? Our lizard brain doesn't want us to think that. Yeah. Um, another great book is Lynchpin by Seth Godin. He talks a lot about this, um, which I think is, which is, which is really, really, really important. You have to keep reminding yourself, right? You have to affirm yourself, but in a way your affirmation of yourself is like, your acceptance of God or your consciousness or your higher power's affirmation of you, right? If you affirm yourself, then you are affirmed. Um, and yeah. that, that's like, you gotta, you gotta do, you know, you have to see yourself in the context of the world um, as a gift. And some days will be better than others and that's okay. That's how, that's how the world, that's how the world turns. Yeah. <laughs> I love the way that you're saying too, like there's no, um, there's, there's no wrong path. You're going to end up on the path that you need to be on. And it's just having the trust and the faith and whether that be trust in yourself or trust in the higher power, it's just having some sort of understanding and constant reaffirmation to yourself that it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I am where I need to be. It's just like a beautiful sentiment. And I love that. It's a mantra. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you know, you keep saying it anyway, whether it works or not. Yeah. It's very easy to like tell somebody to do it. It's harder to get yourself to yeah. do it again. Yeah. It. You are in the right place at the right time. I am a terrible human being. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's switch. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh man. It's so well, thank you so much for this whole talk. I'm so glad that you brought up the spirituality aspect because I do think that it's so important. And even for those that are not spiritual or religious or anything, it's good to recognize that that's an opportunity or an option if you want it. And you don't yeah. have to take it, but at least bringing it into people's heads allows them to go, oh yeah, I want that or I don't want that. And I think just to bring this full circle to my idea around ideological clarity and purpose, one of the things that I think is powerful around faith is that is a place where you find people who share that ideological conviction. It's not to say that all people who ascribe to one sect of any given religion or different, you know, different religions are good or bad people, but that faith is 
faith communities are one place where people do place a strong premium on being explicit about their ideology. Um, and so I think that, that it is a place where you can find, if you are feeling alone in the world or like you don't have a community of support that shares your worldview, articulating that worldview and then looking to faith communities as a place where you might find the kind of people who, who do, who are supportive of your, of your values, that that is a really, um, that is a really great thing. And, and faith communities exist everywhere in the world. Yeah. So that is also something, you know, any, any city that you show up in, you're going to find a Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, I'm not, you know, like you're going to find all the things somewhere. Um, so being, I think, and a lot of faith communities are great about welcoming newcomers. So, you know, just like that, I actually was not raised with faith. I came to faith, I came to the Episcopal church later in my life. So I had sort of a reverse journey, um, in a way. Um, and, and it was really incredible for me the first day that I walked into a church and I felt so out of place. I was like, what am I doing here? I don't know anything about what's happening. Um, but feeling so welcomed and embraced by all the people who were there and realizing um, all of the ways in which I did feel really connected to um, the Episcopal Christian tradition. And then later learned that my family had historically been Episcopalians. It was just my grandparents who decided to become atheists and you know, trickle that down to my mom and so on. So, um, funny that you ended up finding the same church of like your ancestors. If like, like that, that's it's really so funny. funny. <laughs> it's also like a church that I walked by every day on my way between home and work, like yeah. every day. And so I was like, Oh, I, maybe I should go to a church. What church should I go to? Oh, how about this one? And then I told my uncle and he was like, Oh, we're Episcopalians. It's an Episcopal <laughs> church. I was like, the world is so freaking weird. You were like, I didn't know that. Like, I, like, I, I didn't choose this. Somebody else made a decision about something somewhere. I'm not sure what, but I'm going with it. Maybe a higher power made the decision. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Hard to say. Hard to say. Yeah. Hard to say what it is. Anyway. Uh, yeah. To wrap this up, thank you so much. I love that we talked about purpose in business and how we tied it back into so many other things, including, you know, even self-care and then getting to the more spiritual aspects of business. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time. I've loved having you. It's been great. And if people want to get into, like, they want to know more about um, uh, Heptagon, like the book, how should they reach you for that? So right now you can find me on uh, Instagram at AllieBoness underscore. If you want to follow me, there'll be updates there. You can also sign up for email updates on my website, heptagonproductions.com.